Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, this is my first time on the stage, but not the first time meeting many of you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Yap. I am the associate director of the DFR Lab. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about a report that the DFR Lab did called Breaking Gouda. And I'm very pleased to be joined on stage right now by Elizabeth Surkov. Uh, she's a research fellow at the uh, Forum for Regional Thinking. Elizabeth is also the main author of this report and an overall expert on MENA and Syria specifically. If any of you have any interest in the region, you should definitely follow her on Twitter. She's one of the uh, most insightful voices on the, on the region. Um, before we go into the report, I'm going to give a brief overview and history of the DFR lab because our growth over time kind of uh, parallels the trajectory we had in this report as well. Um, we were founded three years ago, um, in 2016, and it was based off this report called Hiding in Plain Sight. Hiding in Plain Sight tracked Russian interference in eastern Ukraine, annexation of Crimea. With Hiding in Plain Sight, we had a hashtag. It was called Putin at War. This was basically to crowdsource evidence of Russian violations in the region. And what we saw was that after the invasion of Crimea in 2014, more and more this hashtag was popping up in Syria. And this was, of course, because of increased Russian interference in, in the region and support of the Assad regime. So what we started doing was using our tools, open source methodology, geolocation, verification, and applying it to the conflict in Syria. And the first report that we did along those lines was distract, deceive, destroy. Before I go into some of the examples, just a, quick, uh, a brief overview that there are some graphic images here. This is a war zone, it's a conflict zone, uh, incredibly horrible humanitarian uh, issues at stake, so just be aware that that's happening right after lunch. So distract, deceive, destroy. You have the Russian Ministry of Defense. They're saying all the foreign messaging about our activity in Syria is false. We are in Syria to target rebels. We are countering ISIS. That is our mission. Don't listen to the West. In fact, we knew that they were there to support the Assad regime. They were targeting rebels and fighters who were targeting Assad. They, helpfully to us, told us, we can prove this through objective monitoring. The evidence speaks for itself. The evidence that we can put out shows that we're there to fight ISIS. Lucky for us, what the DFR lab does is objective monitoring. We do open source. So we took them up on this challenge, and we said, great, you have this open source evidence. Let's take a look at it. This is one example of this. So we had evidence that the Russian MOD had targeted a mosque. And this was verified through a number of on-the-ground accounts, uh, images on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, that we can verify, cross-reference with satellite imagery that we've discussed earlier today to prove that this happened. The Russian Ministry of Defense, in reaction, posts this picture. And they say, look, here's the mosque that you're claiming to have hit. There's no damage to it. You can see on satellite imagery that nothing's wrong. So we go to the evidence. And we find exactly the point they're claiming on Google Maps. This is entirely public, entirely open source. You can take the coordinates yourself right now, plug it into your device, and find the same image. So that's what we do. We cross-reference this with Google Maps, and we overlay it with the map that the Russian MOD was supposing to claim that they had targeted a mosque that hadn't actually been damaged, calling the claims false. What we found when we did this was that the mosque they were pointing out was actually on the entire other side of town. <laughs> so they had picked a random target entirely. This is the mosque that they say was hit, that there was no damage at. The, the claim target that they had put out this proof to disprove, and this was the actual target. And what they did was put a map over it. They put a sign over it to cover in their public imagery that this was not actually the mosque that was targeted. So this is the most blatant example of disinformation, intentionally spreading false information to deceive. They knew exactly where the mosque was. On Google Maps, you could prove that it had been damaged, 
and yet in their public imagery they had put to prove that it hadn't been, they put a map over it. That's a brief example of, of distract, deceive, destroy. This led to our next report, Breaking Aleppo, where we did a similar sort of investigation to comprehensively document the war crimes that had occurred there, siege tactics, cluster munitions, chemical weapons usage, to really document in archival format all the atrocities that had occurred throughout the siege of Aleppo. The damage was catastrophic from the beginning of the war to the end. Um, and through open source, we were able to document a lot of this. And this led to the report we're talking about today, Breaking Gouda. In Breaking Gouda, we used many of the same tactics to document the siege and the impact on the population. One of that is by analyzing imagery put out by the MOD itself. So this is RT footage. Many of you know RT is the Russian state-sponsored disinformation outlet. They like to brag about their activities. They like to say that they're doing a lot of things, and they post this video. And it shows us cluster bombs. They then edit the footage of cluster bombs. As you can see, they conveniently clipped it right at the time where the munitions themselves were visible. So this is yet another blatant example of open source imagery, public propaganda they had put out to say that they were doing great things in Syria, fighting against rebels, or fighting against not rebels, but ISIS. And in fact, through open source, through the caching of YouTube, we're able to find the actual evidence and prove that in fact, when they say they're not using chemical weapons or cluster munitions, they are. It's there in the Im imagery, in the photos. Why this work's so important is because in the information warfare space, there's a lot of he said, she said. The West says, we're not doing the right thing in Syria. We're saying we are. And we're trying to model the information environment. We have this from direct admission from the Russian MOD, saying how impactful information warfare was in their tactical and military activity in Russia, in, in Syria, that it would not have been as impactful if this information warfare wasn't successful. This is seen most clearly in some of the false flag tactics and attacks that they used throughout the conflict. Uh, after the Contra Khan chemical attacks, Russia really ramped up its usage of these tactics and, and muddling of the information space. And they used a, a variety of, um, of tactics to do this. Uh, one of the main ones was basically false flags, saying that we're not doing this. It's actually the US that's doing this. It is foreign governments. Uh, there was a viral clip at the time. Uh, the Russian MOD put out a uh, imagery, and they claimed this is evidence explicitly that the US is in Syria to support ISIS. And they put a, a video clip of an airstrike supporting a convoy that they claimed was an ISIS convoy. And very quickly it was debunked. And what they found out was that this clip was not, in fact, actual imagery. It was a video game. It was a gunship simulator from a mobile game app the Russian MOD had put out to claim that the US was actively supporting ISIS in Syria. And again, this could be debunked. There were photos of the original game that were juxtaposed with this imagery to show how ridiculous this claim was. But as the claims add up from the Russian side, they're attempting to muddle the overall information environment and cast doubt on what can be known or not known in the conflict itself. That was the same thing seen after the Duma attack. A lot of the claims that Western governments themselves were the ones doing these attacks and that it wasn't them. Luckily, we can prove this false. That's what Elizabeth is about to go into shortly. We can use the tactics we've discussed over the last two days that we're about to discuss later today in another interactive session to really prove chemical weapon usage, prove cluster munitions, show it, document it, all through transparent and objective sourcing. So I'm going to do one last video that overviews some of the findings of Breaking Gouda. Uh, warning once again, it is a bit graphic, and then Elizabeth is going to go into some of the actual findings, the people on the ground who made this possible, and the impact it has on, on really shedding truth in this war zone. 
Ah, sorry, this is just an example of some of the disinformation tactics spread. If you look in the report, this is explained more, but uh, we can do network analysis to basically show how the spread of these disinformation uh, narratives spread. There's a network of known accounts that amplify RT, Sputnik, known Russian disinformation networks that work to amplify the narratives coming out of the Kremlin and its cronies. And Please mean, read more on the reports that are on your desk that documents that. A lot of this work was done by uh, Ben Nemo, our great fellow who you've seen earlier. Hello, um, I want to talk to you today about the importance of using open source information in documenting war crimes. Breaking Gulta was authored by the DFR Lab team and outside experts led by Emma Beals. Uh, we published a report in September 2018. Uh, in this presentation, I wanted to share some of the major findings and how this report uh, was made possible. Um, the Syrian uh, civil war is arguably the major arena for disinformation operations, particularly so uh, since Russia intervened in the war directly in late 2015 and has an interest in spreading uh, misinformation about what is happening on the ground. Russia and the regime consistently deny carrying out war crimes. Our report proved that they are lying. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what Eastern Ghouta is. Um, those are basically the eastern suburbs of Damascus. Uh, the area fell uh, out of regime control uh, in 2012 and was placed under siege by the regime in 2013. The area survived five years of suffocating siege, the longest siege in modern history. Um, during that siege, hundreds of civilians perished they starved to death or they died due to lack of medicine. The regime prevented those from entering the area. In late 2017, uh, the regime in Russia decided to put an end to the siege, not by opening it up, but uh, by uh, retaking the territory. They launched a ferocious campaign uh, on the area uh, to retake it uh, from the rebels. We are hearing the sounds of a cluster munition attack at 3 a.m. March 23, 2018, as recorded by Syrian media activist Musallam Abdul Basit, hiding underground in Saqba, a town in eastern Ghouta. There were 346 attacks per day throughout the 49 days of the campaign on average, which is 14.4 attacks per hour. Imagine living under this. We can see here the situation in Ghouta before the start of the uh, regime and Russian offensive to retake the area. The areas in white are controlled by the regime. Uh, the areas in orange are controlled by the opposition. Here we can see the progress of the offensive. The territory gradually shrank uh, under the control uh, of the opposition. 
at the end of the campaign, the entire area fell uh, under regime control. Uh, tens of thousands of people uh, were displaced from this area to the rebel-held north, uh, while the rest of the population surrendered to uh, the Assad regime. Here we can see uh, in the map uh, documented cases of chemical weapon use. The Syrian regime and Russia deny the regime's use of chemical weapons. During the offensive on Ghouta, the regime carried out at least six uh, suspected chemical weapons attacks, which is part of the 336 documented chemical weapon attacks perpetrated by the Assad regime uh, throughout the Syrian civil war until the end of 2018. Since then, there have been additional uh, chemical weapons attacks in Syria. So the most deadly and politically significant uh, chemical weapons attack in this offensive took place on April 7th, 2018 in Douma. Between 40 to 70 people were gassed to death. The, attacks ma the attack matters a great deal because of the timing. Uh, the attack was uh, carried out on Douma, which was at the time the last town in eastern Ghouta still under the control of the opposition. The group in control of Douma, uh, the Army of Islam, was refusing to surrender and was negotiating with the regime to try and remain in Ghouta and become essentially a uh, sanctioned uh, pro-regime uh, militia. And the regime was having none of it to compel the army of Islam to surrender the town. Uh, this attack was launched, and less than 24 hours after this attack was perpetrated, the army of Islam, one of the strongest factions among the rebels in Syria, surrendered. They handed over dozens of tanks and a huge cache of ammunition and weaponry to the regime as part of the surrender. They could have kept on fighting, they had the weaponry, but this chemical attack and the pressure that they faced from civilians after this attack to surrender is what allowed the regime to uh, finish off uh, this fight. As you can see, the, uh, the cylinder uh, used in this attack, which was, uh, this is an image grabbed from a video uh, available on YouTube. Um, the elements of this uh, gas cylinder um, is identical to gas cylinders used in other uh, attacks on opposition-held area, on Masak and Hanano in Aleppo, in Khan al Asal, uh, also in Aleppo, um, in 2016 and 2017. The attack um, on Douma uh, was carried out by two transport helicopters that took off from the Dumer Air Base near Damascus. Uh, they carried the cylinders and dropped them over, over Ghouta. We know the, tra the flight path of these helicopters through a monitoring network spread out across Syria that was established by the opposition to keep track of uh, helicopters and jets taking off to bomb um, opposition-held areas. In the re Breaking Quota report, we also discussed the use of incendiary weapons. Uh, the use of incendiary weapons uh, by the Russians is well documented since their intervention in the Syrian civil war. Al-Assad is in the city of Al-Fosfor. The bombing of Bashar Assad forces Duma city is Guta. My God. This is what it looks like under an incendiary weapons attack. Um, this video was recorded in Duma on March 23rd, 2018 by Abdullah Halbuni. I want to highlight the people in the front lines, risking their lives to document war crimes. These are the people who make the work of digital Sherlock's possible. I mentioned these two people earlier in the presentation. Uh, what I did not mention and is that 
these people are my friends. Um, they were so excited when I told them that I'll be speaking to you here today, utilizing the material that they had risked their lives to film and record. Both of them have been injured and had dozens of their friends and relatives killed in the war. They are two of the hundreds of Syrians inside Syria with whom I am in touch uh, uh, as part of my research. Many of them are actually watching us right now, despite not understanding English. They were so grateful that the documentation of atrocities done to them is receiving center stage here right now. Abdullah Halbouni, uh, who goes by the name Leif Abdullah as well, uh, began taking photos and videos in 2012 when he was uh, 18. Abdullah is the one who recorded the video you just saw. Uh, during the last offensive on Ghouta, his home was destroyed by an airstrike and he was injured in a chlorine attack. He is now in Idlib, documenting new war crimes as the regime in Russia bombed schools and hospitals in this last rebel-held area of Syria. On the left is Msalem Abdul Basit, also known as Muhammad Abdullah. He began taking photos and videos in 2011 in his hometown of Saqba when he was just 15. The audio recording you heard earlier was made by him. Msalem is also the one who took the photo of this munition dropped on Ain Tarma in eastern Ghouta in March 2018. This is the submunition of RBK 500 Zab 2.5 SM incendiary cluster bombs that the edited video that uh, Nick showed you earlier uh, removed from sight. Russia, by the way, denies using incendiary weapons in Syria categorically. On the left, we see an attack carried out by the Russians on March 22nd, 2018. The geolocation by DFR lab shows that at least two locations were hit, both of them in residential areas in Kafar Batna, bombing civilian areas with incendiary weapons or cluster munition is a war crime. Activists on the ground like Salem and Abdullah have documented the use of incendiary weapons throughout the conflict by taking photos of spent munition and the effects of these attacks. This is the aftermath of the Kafar Batna incendiary attack I just showed you. This is the corpse, the charred corpse of one of the victims. Dozens of people perished this way throughout the offensive on Eastern Ghouta. Activists on the ground have also documented the use of cluster munition, including the 308 uh, rocket assisted cargo projectile dropping the O10 submunition and airdrop munition, uh, either the RBK 500 or the KMGU universal dispenser dropping the AO 2.5 RT submunitions. Uh, Russian state TV um, documented jets armed with these weapons taking off from Hamimim uh, Air Base in Latakia, their main base in uh, Syria. Uh, these attacks, once again, as you can see on the map, were geolocated to major population centers. Here we can see some of the uh, spent munition, unexploded munition uh, in the attacks on eastern Ghouta. It is obvious that those who fired these munitions showed a blatant disregard to the safety of civilians inhibiting these urban areas or intended deliberately to target them. It repeats a, a pattern observed throughout opposition-held Syria throughout the war. ومع انتهاء سنوات الحرب الطويلة في الغوطة الشرقية ومرور عام على تحريرها من الرشس الإرهاب أبناء بلدة أن الشابية التي عانت من ويلات الحرب خرجوا يحتفلون بالذكرى السنوية لتحرير الغوطة المتزامنة مع ذكرى جلاء المستعمر الفرنسي الغاشم عن أراضي سوريا بفضل تضحيات الأبطال الذين استرخصوا دماءهم الذكية في سبيل عزة ومنعة كل ذرة تراب مؤكدين إصرارهم على الصمود والعمل على إعادة الإعمار وحبهم للحياة كما نوه الم... So this video uh, was taken this April, a year after uh, Ghouta fell uh, under regime and control. Uh, this video appeared on uh, Syrian state television, and it shows the announcer is talking about the celebration of the people of the one-year anniversary of their liberation from the filth of the terrorists. I'm showing this video to you to shed light on a major problems that we have as 
digital Sherlocks, as people using open source information to track crimes, to, take, to track human rights abuses? What happens after reconciliation, after these areas surrender to the regime? Basically, these areas become black holes of information. Um, abuses happen, uh, but they are incredibly dangerous to document. Uh, this is something we need to be thinking about. What kind of violence we are able to document, what kind we are not able. State terrorism is not just about burning people alive in plain sight, as you saw before. Some people are being bur burned and tortured, as we speak right now, but in torture dungeons, far from sight. But we still have access to what is happening uh, in Eastern Ghouta right now, just not open source uh, information. That information is gleaned from uh, conversations with people who are still there utilizing encrypted messaging apps. Um, we have information from um, opposition-run uh, web news websites. And through those sources, we know that Arrests are happening in Eastern Ghouta now on a daily basis. People are being uh, forcibly conscripted into the military and into militias. There are significant restrictions on movement of people to the point where even though the area is officially no longer under siege, people are, have died in Eastern Ghouta of cancer, for example, simply for, by not being allowed to go and seek treatment in Damascus, which is just a few kilometers away. Uh, we also know through uh, contacts with people on the ground that Russia interfered with the OPCW investigation into the chemical attack in Duma uh, by preventing access to the area and apparently trying to clean it up. We also know that Russia and the regime pressured medical personnel uh, in Ruta who were witnesses to the Duma attack and its aftermath and its victims pressuring them to go on Russian state TV, on Sputnik, on uh, Russia Today, on regime media, and deny that the attack ever happened. I want to thank you um, for bearing with me through this presentation um, and witnessing the important work of Syrians and open source investigators who aim to increase accountability for some of the worst crimes of the century. Thank you very much. We're going to turn to Q&A right now, um, but before I think it's important to comment on how the human side of this is so impactful to open source. We talk about open source as imageries, tweets, YouTube videos. Those are all posted by people, and they can't be posted unless free information environment, um, access to internet, basic human safety is allowed to have the internet you know, provide these resources in the first place. And we see that much more in a lot of investigative reporting, not only using open source, but combining it with the traditional journalistic methods necessary. Um, so turning to Q&A, please raise your hand if you have any questions. We have some mic runners in the room. Uh, to start, though, we can go to some of our app questions. Um, I think for you, Elizabeth, some of the questions on the impact of, of uh, Guta sure. and the siege specifically. What were the main tactics used, and sure. how did that impact rebel resistance? So the, the regime in Russia used overwhelming firepower um, to uh, basically break through rebel defenses. They, and this is a pattern that we've seen throughout the conflict. By targeting uh, civilian areas, the, the, the desire of the regime, the intention, is to get the civilians to pressure rebels to surrender faster. Uh, at the same time, the regime maintains negotiation tracks with uh, local leaders inside uh, rebel-held towns, who then, when the attacks intensify, when the population is driven underground, people spent entire weeks underground during this offensive. Um, they were surviving on very little water and food. The idea was you pressure the population to such an extent that the population then applies pressure on the rebels to surrender. And indeed, several towns, there was not much fighting. For example, in Saqaba and Misraba, those towns largely um, surrendered without a significant fight. And the, um, the use of chemical weapons uh, was particularly effective. First of all, it is incredibly terrifying. I know because um, 
many of my contacts were um, uh, subjected to such attacks, uh, not just uh, in Ruta. Uh, they terrify the population. You do not see the weapon around you. You, you can smell something, but you, it is incredibly terrifying. In addition to that, um, any uh, weaponry that involves the use of gas can seep through to the underground shelters where the population was hiding out. And this is why um, there was significant pressure applied on rebels, and we saw the surrender. And this happened with the Duma chemical attack as well. Actually, after the attack, there were protests happening in Duma by the population against the rebels, saying, please surrender. We want to surrender. We want to survive. We want to live. Do we have any questions from the audience? Right here. Um, how long did it take you to put together this report? How many hours did you work? How many manpower? Like, how, <laughs> how lengthy is this? How big? I think Ben can comment um, on that, too. <laughs> so um, there was an amazing team at DFR Lab. Uh, Emma Beals, who is a fantastic journalist, led the effort. Um, we worked for several weeks, but did not sleep much. Um, uh, I know that Emma and I, we were kind of losing it towards the end, uh, typing, uh, you know, uh, through bloodshed eyes. Um, but all of this work was made possible because of courageous individuals, uh, as I mentioned, who spent entire years going out and documenting uh, these uh, weapons. So we can count our weeks of work, uh, but we also need to keep in mind the years of work that Syrians have been doing on the ground and continue to do on the ground till this day. Every day you can go out and you can watch on YouTube new videos coming out with new evidence of war crimes happening in Syria right now as we speak. Yeah, breaking Gouda and previously breaking Aleppo, um, the work was in many ways archival. A lot of the videos we've shown were not flagged initially by our researchers, they were flagged by the community. A lot of our work is corroboration. Um, the maps that we showed of the chemical weapons and cluster munitions attacks, none of those pinpoints were put in as actual attacks unless we had multiple points of verification for any of them. So a lot of this work is really the verification process of combing through the data and finding as many points as reference as possible. It's when you're making a claim as significant as war crimes of chem chemical weapon cluster munitions, you need to have that evidence to back it up. Um, we're very short on time, but I think we can take one final question from the audience. And I'm happy then to, if you want to approach me and ask me those questions, because they're all ex excellent, I'm happy to answer them off stage. <laughs> I think we have one in the back here. Uh, my name is Andrea Iotti. I work for BBC Monitor, and I work extensively in Syria during the conflict, and I work with Syrian journalists as well. Uh, so my first question is about uh, the security of your communications with sources mm. inside, because it's something I, I've been, I mean, I, it's an issue I face myself, especially when Assad forces take control yes. of a territory. So how safe are your communications with activists or journalists on the ground? Because to my um, understanding now, it's not anymore a priority for them. Like, so even if you, if you try to tell them, like, okay, we should have an encrypted conversation, like, or using certain channels, that's not their priority, of course, under siege or in, in certain circumstances. And secondly, as an Israel-linked analyst, uh, journalist, how challenging it was for you to approach Syrian journalists and activists who know, are well aware that the mere fact of providing, supplying information to an Israel-linked uh, journalist could be used to legitimize their work. Thanks. So I've been in touch with Syrians uh, since 2009, so even before the start of the uprising and then civil war. Um, I think the fact that um, I have a record of activism on Israel-Palestine and for Palestinian rights definitely helped my credibility. There are some Syrians who are not interested in talking to me, but I think we've also seen a significant shift in Arab public opinion and Syrian public opinion with regards to Israel, uh, some of which I think is, has gone way too far to the point where people are adopting uh, points made by uh, Israeli misinformation <laughs> operations. Um, but um, because the regime uh, and uh, Iran and Hezbollah, which are enemies of Israel, are attacking them, some of them have, have now gone on to uh, support Israel um, and Israeli assistance to the opposition, very limited also, um, improved uh, Israel's image and I think uh, made people less afraid of just engaging with Israelis. 
Um, with regards to communication with people in areas that have now, are now under regime control, it's definitely a huge challenge. I make sure, of course, to communicate only with, through encrypted uh, applications. Uh, thankfully, WhatsApp is uh, used by all Syrians pretty much, uh, and it is um, well encrypted. Um, so I've been able to, to, to talk to people this way, and actually we've seen in recent we, we, uh, weeks attempts by the regime, apparently, uh, to restrict access to, to WhatsApp. There are outages uh, in uh, regime-held uh, areas. Um, but it's definitely, after areas fall under regime control, people are just less interested in talking because they are afraid. So what I do is I listen. I don't pose any sensitive questions. If a person wants to tell me something that has happened in, in their town, in their neighborhood, to their father, to their brother, who've been arrested, then I listen. But I don't ask any sensitive questions. There are some people I've now gone on to simply talk to them about food. We don't talk about politics at all. Uh, while others are still interested in, in talking about what is happening around them, and particularly how they are feeling. Uh, we, we have to remember that you know, the population that remained in Ghut and remained in other areas that surrendered to the regime have, have been through these horrors. They know what the regime is, is capable of, but they're just incredibly tired. So the fact that they are under regime control does not mean that they support the regime, and unfortunately the regime knows this as well. So they are very angry, and they are in a lot of pain, a lot of emotional pain, uh, and they want to let it out, and I am there to listen. Um, that's also interesting because it ties back the question of communication to some of our earlier sessions about the regulation of different apps and messaging and platforms because a lot of times that conversation has come to from the perspective of how do you curb the spread of disinformation. The flip side is the security and making it reliable is important to on-the-ground communications. Lots of activists use these platforms, so in many ways there's two sides of the same coin.